Hello, let's get started again. This is the panel on social legal architecture of markets. Right? We have here Professor Gustavo Onto, Professor André Naum, Sara Marinho and Pedro Mualen. Professor Gustavo Onto is a uh, professor of social anthropology at the National Museum. He holds a PhD uh, on social anthropology. Um, he does research on uh, at the Research Center for Anthropology of, uh, that's, I'm sorry, this is the name of your institution. It's, it's the, yeah, the Research Center for Anthropology. I'm sorry about that. It's the Research Center for Anthropology of the State, uh, Regulation and Public Policy at, at the Graduates Program in Sociology and Anthropology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He does uh, economic policy and regulation, antitrust and central banking. Uh, and does ethnography on those topics. Um, Professor André Naum. André Vereta Naum is a professor of sociology at the University of São Paulo. He's also an re associate researcher at SEBRAP, the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, and at NUCI, the Research Center on Culture and Economy at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He currently leads with Frederick Wery from Princeton, the Comparative Research Project on Circuits of Economic Life in Times of Crisis. Pedro Salomon Bezerra Mualen, right on my right, uh, is a PhD candidate in economic law at the University of Sao Paulo and a, research at, a researcher at FGV Law School, where we are. His research interests cover sociology on banking markets, political economy, and sociology of law. And Sara Marinho is an LLM SJD candidate at the University of Wisconsin and a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo. Sara holds a master's degree in law and development from FGV Sao Paulo, and her research concentrates on the policy treatment of foreign investment and state businesses relations in multinational corporations. So we will have uh, first Gustavo and then André and then Pedro and then Sara with fi 15 minutes each, not more than that, maybe perhaps a bit more than that. I'll, I will be enforcing the time. Not more than 16. <laughs> I'll make sure. That Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about part of a concluded research I conducted on antitrust policy and agency and the antitrust agency in Brazil. Uh, I'm gonna start with an anecdote. Uh, so since I first started researching antitrust policy around 10 years ago, from the perspective of the social sciences, more specifically the actions of CAGI, the Administrative Council for Economic Defense, the Brazilian antitrust body, I was constantly asked one type of question. So, Gustavo, tell me, does CAGI actually work? By this, my interlocutors were trying to know if the agency had the capacity to actually punish, inhibit, and deauthorize certain corporate conducts in the country, if it was capable of actually guaranteeing a minimum amount of competition in various markets. At that time, I answered with a firm no. CAGI didn't seem to work at all. I had the expectation that I would find strong technical and political disputes between regulators and lawyers, economic consultants about controversial anti-competitive practices or M&As. However, the disputes were almost non-existent or were made to disappear somehow. Kaji seemed to rarely condemn an economic conduct or disapprove a merger or acquisition. Constant meetings, several telephone calls, shakes of hands, and the enormous production of bureaucratic documents contributed to the unexperienced, uh, inexperienced researchers' sense that the antitrust policy was probably just a form of simulacrum of economic governance. Above all, the discovery that the top private lawyers and high-profile regulators had studied in the same class, same year, at the law school we were just yesterday, didn't help me changing my mind about this at that time. However, Acting as, as a participant observer of the daily practice of that organization, I suddenly realized that my own answer and the question posed to me uh, 
had a particular assumption that I myself was, was not aware of in the beginning of my field work. It implied a particular understanding of what it means to govern the economy or its markets. A moral understanding as well, still ingrained in great part of the social sciences, that any sort of relation between state and private actors results in a less independent or autonomous state, less capable uh, the state will be to defend public interests. So, but while this is certainly true in many ways, it is also worth noting that competition or antitrust policy can only work in a certain sense through several forms of relations that usually go unnoticed, undescribed, and under-theorized. From an anthropological perspective, the circulation of people, knowledge, and artifacts is what makes possible would make what make possible the government of competition. I would like to explore some of these relations, the ones that have to do specifically with the knowledge and governance of markets. In this communication, I would like to propose uh, to reframe this understanding of the role of, pub of pub policy and law in the economy or in markets in terms of recent developments in economic anthropology and economic sociology, characterizing economic governance as an issue related to the performativity of legal and economic knowledge. What, I, what I'd like to do is to simply point out very briefly three mechanisms by which markets are shaped, transformed, or oriented by antitrust. <clears throat> Before addressing these three, three points, it's worth summarizing very briefly what we can call the performative turn. In 1998, sociologist Michel Callon edited a book called The Laws of the Markets that was to become reference to economic sociologists and anthropologists. By criticizing what, what he considered the limited focus at that time in the social embeddedness of economic action in the new economic sociology literature, Calon argued that the economy is not simply embedded in social relations, but embedded in economics. Based on John Austin's pragmatist uh, linguistics and on several other uh, authors, he argued social scientists should aim to understand how economic knowledge performs, shapes, and formats the economy. Economic theories, descriptions, concepts, and models are not mere representations of the economic world, as economists like to argue, but are tools that perform or format th this world through practices, experiments, and policies. In the last 20 years, several studies have shown how different forms of economic knowledges contribute to the construction and shaping of economic objects, like markets, prices, national economies, as well as economic subjectivities. Economic knowledge builds the reality in the process of description or explanation. Economic realities are not given, but have to be made to exist. This is a reframing uh, of, in a way, of several classic uh, studies in our discipline, like Polanyi, Michel Foucault, Marcel Mauss, Louis Dumont, and many others. <clears throat> but the crit crucial gain of this approach more recently is its empirical stance on how, in practice, economic objects and subjects are made to exist. Regarding markets, for example, the literature has described an enormous variety of elements, devices, that are necessary to make them in the first place, like formulas, models, technological artifacts, architectural environments, contracts, skills, cultural perceptions, infrastructures of all kinds. Authors have demonstrated how material and discursive arrangements are put together and transformed to make possible the exchange of goods and services in different contexts. But how to understand the role of antitrust in shaping such complex social technologies such as markets. Economic sociologists have described only one main performative stance that clearly formats markets in antitrust. Sociologists Neil Fleekstein and Frank Dobbin, for example, showed how antitrust law and decisions shaped markets and economic behaviors in US economic history. Uh, Brad Christopher, a geographer, affirms in a recent article that competition law and policy is one of the clearest examples of performativity in economic theory, of economic theory since market definitions clear, uh, create barriers between real markets, leading to the prohibition of certain corporate practices. Michel Callon uh, says regarding performativity of law and competition law specifically, that while cons constituting each as an independent entity, law together with accounting metrology and marketing management is well situated. Uh, uh, he, what he thinks is that it's an essential link, an irreplaceable coupling device between theoretical work and eco economic practices, for it organizes real experiments. Crucial in here is the importance of the so-called definition of the relevant market in antitrust. As most of you probably know, an internationally adopted antitrust technicality aimed at building both a legal and economic context for the interpretation 
and decision of a case. The relevant market definitions based on particular economic theories frame corporate actions and relations, clearly shaping future markets and sectors. However, competition law or policy doesn't perform markets only through its decisions and rulings. More than that, this form of performativity doesn't do justice to the way my interlocutors themselves, regulators inside the antitrust agency, understand their performative agencies. To understand this, we must consider the relevant market as the reflexive knowledge practice. From an ethnographic perspective, markets are also performed through several practices involving document production, circulation, and distribution among and between governmental agencies, companies, and their legal representatives. It is through these documents and charts, forms, graphs, photos, maps, and indexes inscribed in them that companies try to defend their practices or develop an argument for merging with another entity. It is also mainly through these graphic artifacts of documentation and visualization that regulators build the necessary knowledge to decide their cases and shape certain practical understandings about the competitive context in different markets. This means that performativity in economic anthropology implies both a focus on written definitions, textual, oral statements by which markets are enacted, and the practical procedures of definition, the material objects that are necessary to this definition, the forms or aesthetics in which this definition is produced. Uh, anthropologists of bureaucracies have shown that artifacts such as documents are relevant because they shape the perception of the limits of regulatory action as well as the boundaries of the objects of regulation. According to anthropologist Annalise Riles, anthropologist and legal scholar, who studied legal documents in the financial markets, these artifacts are crucial technologies to format or standardize the market because of their unique ability to travel across boundaries. Cultural boundaries, forms of expertise, institutions, physical distances by virtue of their material or aesthetic form. Standardization in this understanding is both a conceptual project and a material project. Therefore, uh, the production and circulation of documents are essential practices in this process of adjusting reality according to particular economic theoretical approaches. Finally, I would like to take seriously narratives that are increasingly important to economic regulatory bodies worldwide. We should attend to the way antitrust regulators, for example, explain and understand the importance of their role as an educational role. Since 1994, for example, CAD in Brazil has been stating in official communications that its main role is not preventing or repressing anti-competitive conducts, but instead spreading culture, the culture of competition in the economy. To re-educate the market according to a new ethics of competition has been a constant ever since. We shouldn't understand this narrative as a mere rhetorical device. If anything, performativity studies in several areas, from gender to organizational studies, have shown that discourse and representation matters. Central banks, for example, know this very well. This is why they treat language, the language they communicate, their assessments and decisions, very carefully. Narrative, narratives shape expectations, suggest future actions, pointing to possible alternatives for economic actors in the future. When narratives are persuasive enough, they shape beliefs about the economic world, and because of this, they produce social facts. Therefore, they are as relevant as material artifacts and decisions and legal norms to shaping markets and enacting particular economic realities. Most of all, they are central to maintaining and gaining legitimacy, without which, as we know, no policy can be implemented successfully. So just to conclude. So in this talk, I just wanted to discuss some new lines uh, in order to understand how law and policies shape markets. Lines of research that focus on issues such as material artifacts, narratives, forms of communication, visualization techniques, and other aspects of the way policies and law are implemented in a very practical sense. I just want to conclude by asking further questions that emerge from an ethnographic point of view. One of them is to ask, for example, how and why do certain legal economic concepts and technicalities disseminate internationally? The relevant market, for example, could be an interesting case to study. But to understand how concepts disseminate is probably less interesting, I think, than to, think, to, to try to describe and understand how they are used in practice in different organizations, national contexts, by different experts and professionals, among regulators or private actors.
Also, we must try to understand how these concepts are interpreted by policymakers, regulators, and other professionals. The way actors interpret a legal norm or an economic concept or issue is, in my opinion, as relevant as, as understanding if a, if a particular legal norm exists somewhere or if the law is enforceable somehow. It seems that, uh, that in our case studies, uh, the use and meanings of particular legal economic concepts must be taken into account for us to grasp the way law shapes markets or the economy, specifically if we're comparing different national contexts. Thank you, that's all. When I was uh, when I was invited, I asked myself what I could contribute to this to this debate, and uh, and the questions were that were posed by the uh, the organizers, and specifically what I could contribute to these questions. Thinking that's the title of this session to the social legal architecture of markets uh, in a way that I I believe offers some social scientific contributions uh, to legal scholarship, which I don't do. Uh, and then I thought that my past research uh, on the night market, a uh, large market, uh, marketplace for inexpensive clothes and accessories in uh, central Sao Paulo could provide some valuable insights to tackle these questions. And especially the second one, uh, mobilizing sort of recent institutionalist literature. Uh, let me know if you agree or disagree with this, this idea, but anyhow, uh, in order to do so, I would need to challenge the contours of the former question. Uh, you know, one, one very common way of answering a question is problematizing the question. That's not what I'm trying to do here. But um, the question mentions uh, law design only. And, and yesterday, some of you brought this already. I believe that to tackle these questions, we uh, must enlarge our analytical scope to include not only design, but also law implementation. Uh, and that, that's one of the basic claims I, 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 I'll make today applied to this ethnographic study I conducted at, uh, at the night market in Sao Paulo. It's needless to say the importance of economic activities in various degrees of uh, informality, formalization to the Brazilian economy. Uh, that could be, that the same could be said about uh, other countries in the developing world. So uh, I also want to focus on, uh, on something that I, I, I think it's a, a contribution from the Global South, uh, not exclusively from the Global South, though. Uh, and in order to, uh, to make these three claims uh, inspired by institutionalist literature, uh, I need to briefly introduce uh, you to the night market. And I'll let these pictures speak for themselves uh, and I'm, this is uh, mostly uh, an introduction to the night market. I'm prepared for foreign audiences. I'm pretty sure that all the locals know the night market very well. It's, it's a joke, by the way. You can laugh now. Uh, and you, you have no valid reason to n uh, not be familiar with this, this area in central Sao Paulo. Uh, this, this, the whole area, actually, uh, comprises this marketplace and this is a market that takes place daily except uh, Sundays from uh, 12 uh, uh, to 4 p.m. in Brass uh, in this, 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 this whole area. Um, it took advantage of an already existing market situation. This, this neighborhood uh, has been an important garment district since uh, the early 20th century with producers and uh, wholesale shops, and thousands of shoppers came daily. Uh, many of those uh, shoppers are traders of clothes in their own cities, uh, and they came from all over the country uh, to buy these clothes. So uh, many uh, informal traders uh, benefit from the area and started selling the streets of this, the, the whole area uh, pictured uh, on the screen. Um, Initially, it only took place in the streets until dawn, but it's now segmented. And besides the streets, uh, it takes place in several buildings that were divided into uh, small stalls, either called galleries or shopping centers, depending on their size, uh, the, the, their, their infrastructure. 
And it also takes place in this uh, wide area, which is uh, a public land. It, it's an abandoned railroad depot, and it takes place in that area since 2005. Uh, in fact, there have been four different configurations for this marketplace since its first material incarnation in 2004, when it took the streets of brass. Um, this, this, this whole scattered uh, landscape is the result of legal design and implementation, and that's my, 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 my basic claim here, that excluded vendors from the public area and did not take into account the multiple conceptions and uses surrounding this marketplace. So Gustavo just uh, told about performativity. This is partially the result of the performativity of theories about market design, uh, but uh, that excluded vendors and uh, both by design and implementation. The night market has been a matter, a matter of public concern, uh, attracting the attention and intervention by state agents and planners since its formation since 2004. It has been held as a compound of disorder and risk associated with regular land use, muggled and counterfeit goods, besides unfair competition with formal businesses. You might now think, well, it's a good thing that authorities are trying to organize this market. It's good for everyone. But good design has users in mind, right? And it is so true, uh, the affordances of the devices uh, it, it mobilizes. Users, however, uh, don't share most of the concerns uh, uh, that turned into device in this market. This is just one example among many others that I captured doing this research with uh, ethnography and, and, and interviews. Ana Julia Perroni, who buys clothes in, in Brazil, uh, it's, uh, she's a YouTuber, uh, advertising clothes that are uh, sold in the area, uh, confided to me that she finds the area wonderful. Uh, first, because I could buy during the night, and let's say I'm not exactly a morning person. Second, because I felt like a child looking to all those clothes in the shops and on the streets. I love fashion and going to a place where I have to find this, the pieces with my style entertains me. With a little bit of patience, you find incredible things with a very good price. Then there's literally my amusement park. She calls the area an amusement park, which is basically this, this problem that uh, attracted so much attention from, from uh, the municipal authorities. But she's just one example of, uh, uh, and m for the vendors and the consumers, this is a fundamental source of income and even more a fantastic place to produce and distribute the fashion models that many Brazilians uh, uh, wear. So uh, I, I use this, uh, uh, this description very briefly to show that this market is a multiple or composite of exchange situations and conceptions that translate different uses of market devices therein. Uh, the views of market planners and regulators are but one of these conceptions. Now, uh, from the first incarnation of the market in the streets and squares of the brass district to this current embodiment, uh, this is under construction here, uh, this market is the frictional result of successive waves of institutional attempts to organize this market. The history and current materialization of this market are the results of continuous efforts by urban planners, town hall representatives and law enforcement agencies to create what they envisage as a proper market devising multiple infrastructural and regulatory devices. The approach to this is a place that needs boundary work to define the space, its characteristics, its fundamental infrastructure of commerce. So uh, they want this to be a, uh, an organized, safe uh, place that ensures equal competition. So one vendor has just one stall. This is, again, the performativity of uh, a theory of competition without private transactions of public land in the streets and the railroad depot. Um, they also want to ensure that only illicit and legal goods are sold there, no counterfeit or smuggled goods. And they also want to ensure that the rightful engine, agents and only the rightful agents to, uh, uh, to be in that area are there. So uh, they define who is an agent through uh, uh, permission to sell in the area. Uh, uh, and, but they also uh, have included uh, uh, across the, uh, along the, the, the last years, uh, uh, a whole bunch of regulations dealing with how the vendors should present themselves and how should they, uh, how they should behave themselves actually uh, uh, selling the, in, in the area. Um, each wave redefined the boundaries of this market, excluding part of the vendors from the group of lawful participants in this market. But this marketplace has not operated over time in the ways envisaged by uh, planners and regulators. 
its daily dealings and the multiplicity, the, sorry, the multiplicity of its material configurations are equally uh, the result of the selective implementation of regulations and the creative agency of its vendors in resisting, subverting, and negotiating the enforcement of the planner's view. The night market, again, is the frictional joint production of the creative and selective implementation of institutional intentions on the one side, under subversion and recreation by the local actors on the other side. So, uh, bridging legal studies and the recent sociology of markets, law can be understood in this context as a market device that distributes its agencies and excludes both by design and implementation. And here are some examples of selective implementation and creative local agency that should suffice to make my point. So basically, uh, uh, law enforcement agents can resort to extortion and use their power to profit from excluded vendors. And, uh, 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 and at the same time, some actors, powerful actors in the area, gain the informal right to control uh, valuable spaces. They are then traded. Uh, there's Obviously, as well, you can uh, they, they count on the uh, tolerance, uh, especially during uh, Christmas time of the police uh, authorities. Vendors, in turn, resist exclusion or seek alternative arrangements to continue working. Uh, persons, notably foreigners, were unable to navigate the bureaucratic requirements to operate in urban land or lack the resources and context that could assist them are faced with the options of either moving to private spaces or venturing to the streets and negotiating with informal brokers of space. I can now finally, that I'm, I'm, I'm heading to my conclusions, turn to the three claims I promise based on this case. First, if we want to mobilize institutionalist contributions to deal with these questions, we must go beyond legal design and not, not very new and considering the analysis, the ambiguity in the implementation and enforcement of institutional norms as well as the creativity of agency in operating institutions. So I'm basically uh, uh, bringing here the contributions that uh, uh, Kathleen Tallinn, James Mahoney, and, uh, and Wolfgang Schreck uh, offered in the past, uh, 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 the previous decade, so 2000, 2010. They show the institutions are not uh, 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 rigid, they are defined not, not, not defined by punctuated equilibria, but uh, uh, they are only interrupted by external shocks. Uh, the, the, the whole history of the night market shows endogenous gradual change. So in the first place, uh, 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 ambiguity and creative actions are sources of institutional gra uh, 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 grade, uh, gradual and ongoing change. But more, more importantly, and, and, and I think this is, is, is an expansion of, of their theory. Implementation in conditions of ambiguity and creative agency can equally operate as sources of institutional diversity, a diversity in the implementation of norms or action under its regulatory scope. Both the way norms are devised and implemented can operate as enabling or restraining tools with clear distribution effects. And uh, of course, I mean, again, I'm, 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 I'm bringing back uh, old contributions from institutionalists like, like, like Lipsky. And finally, another analytical practical problem for law and development is to deal with these this multiple uh, uses and conceptions of markets, uh, which is an analytical and uh, political challenge because it defies the norms, but most importantly, the analytical scope of market planners and regulators. So uh, the recent uh, institutional literature I, I, I bet has something to offer to an understanding of evolving markets in which crises are common and, uh, and, and devices are creatively recreated or simply ignored and replaced by different operational rules by actors. But this requires to understand the market multiple and the ways in which ambiguity and creativity open space for diverse engagements in the implementation, enforcement and resistance to institutional norms. Thank you. So, thank you, I will use it. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, in my presentation, uh, I am to address the, the, the questions of how law is created and mobilized by economic actors and how this process shapes banking markets design and functioning. Uh, first, I will present my approach to this endeavor, and then I will describe in a preliminary fashion the Brazilian case. This is a work in progress and part of my PhD research in which I explore uh, how the state, uh, through the law, shapes banking market institutional architecture in Brazil. 
connecting reflections of the uh, new economic sociology with uh, legal, uh, so social legal studies on the economic field, this approach I'm presenting here makes three main claims, and I will be quicker in the first two. The first claim is that banking markets are institutionally built. In the sense, their organizations, uh, their organization depend on the design of uh, property rights, the enforcement of contracts, depends on forms of regulation, depends on uh, bankruptcy rules, on an apparatus organizing the information flows between regulators and market players, and so on. Uh, these are basically what uh, Bruce Car Carruthers called the, the institutional preconditions of, uh, of uh, financial markets. The second claim uh, is that such an institutional architecture is far from being politically unbiased. Banking activities have sharpening power dispute dimensions. The, con the control of uh, money and credit imply distributive conflicts which are only politically uh, managed. States, for that reason, uh, are deeply involved in institutional constructions of banking markets. The third and last and the last claim uh, follows Richard Swedberg complaint that despite being all over the economic life, uh, law remains marginal in social analysis of the economy. Some authors with whom I agree argue that law can be uh, a privileged lens of analysis which clarifies, uh, cl clarifies first the institutional details of um, Marx and the political disputes and political choices un uh, underlying it. But in this approach, it is necessary to look at law in action. That is to say that we should take as an object of research not only formal rules, but the context they are created and how they are interpreted, mobilized, ignored, or applied in concrete situations by real actors. Law creates the institutional framework of banking marks from two separate but interrelated processes. On the one hand, law naturalized uh, certain concepts, schemes, and interpretations that are relevant to economic activities. By having uh, some of its meanings taken for granted, law incorporates itself into the logic of the economic field. On the other hand, law also entails conflict between normative meanings that can be drawn from its potential interpretations. In this process, the form and the content of law are actively constructed and mobilized as resources of power, becoming at the same time uh, an instrument and the outcome of political dispute. Summing up, we can say that uh, economic irrationality is built hand in hand with uh, legal rationality. Since the law is incorporated into the assumptions of economic activities, and is politically mobilized as uh, a resource in economic action. On the top of that, uh, a social legal analysis can show the multiple arenas in which law is created and implemented. The ideas of arenas of law production show that the state action on the architecture, uh, on the architecture of Marx is a split and contingent one. In this sense, Marx construction is hardly a full planned process. Uh, in the case of banking marks, uh, it can be said that central banks are usually the most relevant arena of law production, but it uh, is not the only one. In this case, it is also relevant to know how does the Congress uh, comply with, opposed to, or create alternatives to the norms established by the central bank? How does the judiciary interpret them? How does the private sector incorporate them into companies' inter internal procedures and how they influence uh, business strategies? How is legal production affected by arena, international arenas of law production, such as the Basel Committee, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, and so on? These are some questions that give you clues about where the law, where the law creates marks and how the state is part of it. I want uh, to give a preliminary example of research on this agenda. I believe that a social legal approach, as I am presenting here, can shed lights on the role played by the Brazilian state in the banking market reconstruction after the monetary stabilization process with Rio Plan in the second half of the 90s.
monetary stabilization uh, made it impossible uh, for banks to keep their profits derived from inflationary revenues. In 1995, uh, Brazilian biggest banks went into crisis and at this point, the Brazilian Central Bank started a series of measures and policies that would not only prevent the banking system from crashing, but also would transform its institutional landscape. Uh, it were, were created policies aiming at saving private banks with insolvent troubles, at moving forward uh, the privatization of state public banks, and at reorganizing uh, federal public bank system. At the same time, the Brazilian government stimulated the entry of foreign financial institutions into the domestic market, basing it on a particular interpretation of the Brazilian constitution, uh, arguing that this process uh, served quotation here, a public interest. Uh, in addition, uh, new regulatory instruments have expanded uh, the central bank intervention powers and have tightened the rules of access to the Brazilian financial system. These measures brought a strong opposition. The Congress, the Brazilian Congress, uh, set up two investigation commissions to verify any irregularities and invited a few times government ministers and uh, the head and the, the directors of central bank to give explanations about uh, these policies. Lawsuits lawsuit were submitted to Supreme Court and challenged their constitutionality. It can be said that this opposition uh, forced the Brazilian gov government to fight for the legitimacy of central banking in Brazil. Long story short, in the end, the controversial me measures produced a new institutional framework for such a market. Existing Brazilian studies uh, present several focuses on this process. The economic approaches emphasize that central bank uh, measures efficiently prevent a systemic crisis. The international political economy approaches stress that uh, external pressures of global organization and financial institutions uh, stress the, the external pressures under which the Brazilian government was submitted. The practical effects of such pressures uh, were, in this account, the absorption of global regulatory standards and the internationalization of banking market. The political approaches uh, highlight the government's strength in promoting its reform agenda, uh, arguing that its legitimacy was straightly linked to popular support to Rio Plan and, of course, uh, to the monetary stabilization. However, each of this, each of this view failed to grasp something. The uh, first view, the economic view, doesn't realize that it was a political process rather than an economic uh, technical one. The second view, the international political economy view, doesn't explore how the international state uh, actors, sorry, how the inter international actors connected themselves with Brazilian domestic uh, processes. The third view, the political one, uh, forget that poli uh, uh, political legitimacy is actually a social uh, process that evolves over time and not a static property. By looking at the law production, we could be able to identify a few things that were not yet explored. As the main point, we can scrutinize how the political legitimacy of the new institutional framework was built step uh, by step along its legal arrangement. I, I can give you uh, three examples of this. First of all, it was the authority of law that empowered the central bank to display new and exceptional intervention measures. Despite it being the qualified authority to regulate the national financial system uh, according to the Brazilian constitution, the uh, uh, Brazilian Congress didn't narrow the central banking actions at first and validated its self-manufactured powers. The command uh, at this moment was to avoid the systemic crisis. However, uh, a few years, years later, it was also through the law that in 2000, the, Brazilian, the same Brazilian Congress limited the, the Brazilian Monetary Authority's capacity, establishing that, uh, quotes again, public resources, including credit operations, uh, should not be used to assist institutions of the national financial system. 
this legal rule have broken the Brazilian central bank ability to, to play the classic role of a uh, lender of last resort. This is uh, explored by Professor Camila Duran in her works. If the, the, the Brazilian Congress comply with the, uh, the Brazilian central bank in the first moment, it, it also has created a huge constraint to it after the risk of a systemic crisis has passed. In a second example, as I said before, foreign institutions or foreign financial institutions have accessed the Brazilian uh, banking markets thanks to a, a specific interpretation of Brazilian constitution. For the Brazilian government, this fresh capital represented a, an additional fund to its enterprise of preventing banks from crashing. In the same vein, the adoption of global standards of minimal capital requirements helped the Brazilian government to politically justify its banking privatization program, um, as, well, uh, as well as its stimulus for market concentration at this time. In addition, international organization, organizations were also seen as a way of gathering political and economic uh, resources for this agenda. In 1997, for example, an agreement of technical and financial aid uh, with uh, World Bank recognized that the central bank, uh, quotes, quotes here, unpreparedness to resolve the, uh, the major bank failures caused a drop in its credibility. And for that reason, the World Bank could help the Brazilian central bank uh, with, quotes again, new approach to bank supervision and especially enforcement uh, to gain uh, broad public support. Any of these situations were seen by Brazilian actors as some kind of external imposition, as the international political economy approach have uh, stressed, but rather as a resource to accomplishing some domestic goals. At the same, uh, the same time, and this is the third and final example, the central bank favored national and international banking mergers and acquisition with cheap credit, public credit, and other facilities. The Bra Brazilian Supreme Court also ensured this process validating all the mentioned and contested measures, as well as allowing the central bank to arrogate to itself the competence of anal analyzing these concent concentration acts. So, in a nutshell, a new business model was forged by state legal hands. In conclusion, uh, I believe that a social legal approach can open the black box of banking market institutional uh, construction. It locates uh, legal scholarship as a privileged point of view, but demand its explicit and continuous dialogue with other so social sciences. Now, I believe it's time to advance it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Mario and Diogo, for inviting me. Uh, it's a challenge and uh, an honor to, to be here uh, as a student uh, presenting my research in progress. Um, I am currently uh, an LLM student at Wisconsin and a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo here, as Diogo said. And uh, I build both my theses around the same general research question, which is how has the state influenced the trajectory of internationalization of Brazilian corporations in the 2000s? I think that uh, investigating this is relevant because um, it seems distant, but not a long time ago, Brazil <laughs> was taken off. And there's still a lot of room uh, to understand what uh, the Brazilian state has accomplished or not during this period. Uh, the law and development literature and, and also other literature sources in uh, comparative political economy uh, have suggested um, there, there was a new state activism present uh, in Brazil during Lula's two terms as president. And uh, that new state activism consisted of uh, horizontal uh, consisted of horizontal public uh, private partnerships, uh, which uh, are still there to be uh, further conceptualized. 
And uh, uh, the basic questions that uh, these literatures asked uh, was how could state intervention reemerge after uh, so many uh, neoliberal reforms that took place in Brazil in the 90s? Um, uh, why use this uh, new kind of state activism if, if it is really different uh, than use uh, new state-owned enterprises? And uh, how have the laws of Brazil responded to this if, if this, this really happens? Um, uh, this is the trajectory of uh, um, FDI flows in Brazil, and economists tend to say that what happened uh, between 2004 and 2011 uh, in regard of outward FDI flows from Brazil is very particular. There must be a, a particular reason to explain that, but uh, the literature, uh, neither the law and development literature has addressed that, or um, the political economy literature, or uh, the economic literature in general. Uh, so I thought that a social legal research inspired by law and development questions could uh, contribute to understand if uh, state policy could be responsible for that in Brazil. Institutional analysis of FDI usually involve um, fiscal, um, investigating the impact of fiscal incentives, insurance against political risk, assistance to outward FDI through government agencies, and the signing of international agreements, such as bilateral investment treaties. Uh, but uh, the problem is, the first problem of uh, investigating this is that we had basically none of these things in force in Brazil in the early 2000s, uh, except for uh, a, a very little investment through BNDES's loans. And economists can't really uh, stress where, where is the causality there. There is definitely a correlation between those things and investment flows, but no one can tell uh, where causality is. Uh, so I soon found a very specific literature in international business studies that talks about state-led FDI. According to this literature, uh, state support is a comparative advantage of emerging market corporations uh, performing FDI when they are successful. And uh, the determinant variables for uh, these authors are not those um, uh, macroeconomic or those general um, um, international incentives, but uh, very specific variables, which are state equity, state lending, and uh, board members with government connections present in actual multinational corporations. I thought this looked like new state activism, and I know we have a lot of this in Brazil, so I, I decided I should start my research there. A relevant detail here is that um, the literature about state-led FDI aims to generalize, uh, to explain what happens in emerging markets in general, but is, it is really based in China as a typical case. So I use this graph not because I think it helps me to study Brazil, but just to stress that each one, uh, this is uh, the trajectory of outward FDI from China from 1982 to 2006. And each number is a, a policy, uh, is a, a legal reform, is an adaptation within the same FDI policy in force in China uh, since 1982 under the same single development plan. So even knowing I have, uh, we have nothing like this in Brazil, we can't have because our governments change. Um, we have the same determinant variable, so I decided to move forward. And I found uh, actually a study of a few Brazilian economists 
that investigated the impact of uh, state ownership, state debt, and the presence of board members in corporations uh, through the Brazilian Development Bank in a sample of 262 cross-border deals uh, from Brazil between 2006 and 2012. And these authors found a positive relationship between these variables and um, the, the size of the stake of Brazilian corporations in, the, in their subsidiaries abroad and also uh, in the value added to their assets abroad. I found these numbers uh, too high because I know that the Brazilian Development Bank uh, had a very limited, uh, offered a very limited initiative towards outward FDI. They have supported less than 20 deals of around 11 corporations between 2005 and 2012. And I also know that in the years that uh, foreign direct investment out of Brazil peaked, a single Brazilian corporation was responsible for at least 50% of this flow. Uh, Vale, for example, uh, was responsible for 67% of the total outward uh, FDI out of Brazil uh, in that year, only with the acquisition, acquisition of uh, two Canadian corporations, Inco and Canico. Uh, considering this, and considering that Vale is a mining privatized corporation that has every kind of uh, state influence possible according to the Brazilian laws, I thought this could be a good case study because Vale has equity debts and board members uh, from the Brazilian Development Bank, along with equity and board members from state pension funds, which are other source of state influence uh, in Brazilian corporations, according to the literature. And uh, since Vale is privatized, it also has golden shares. So I thought, okay, if the government, if the Brazilian government can influence any corporation in Brazil, that must be Vale. Mm -hmm. um, I was, to confirm my intuition, I wasn't the first person to have uh, uh, this idea. Um, uh, the Brazilian economists Rodriguez and Dillerman uh, recently performed a longitudinal case study of Vale's internationalization. And they claim that uh, in the early 2000s, it was only possible because they uh, benefited from large um, uh, state support through lending through the Brazilian Development Bank, which took to their internationalization and to the acquisition of that uh, Canadian uh, large corporation, which saw uh, previously. Uh, but that after they claimed that after internationalization, Valley was so powerful and so independent that the government decided to use its golden shares and uh, the government in Lula's government in that context decided to use the corporate power available to it. Uh, and a state intervention uh, really started, which took to Valley's the internationalization. I, I found that this study helped me a lot, but I found uh, some problems with it. So I am performing a new longitudinal case study of Valley in which I take into account uh, many levels of analysis and I review many uh, empirical resources which we don't have to discuss here. But uh, my, my main um, purpose in performing this new study is, is to understand uh, if did Lula's government really have corporate power to influence Valley's decision making in that period? Uh, if so, if the government ever used such power through corporate governance, and uh, if state power was weaker, weaker or major compared to other sources of corporate power inside uh, this single corporation. And uh, to address these specific question, uh, questions, uh, I first show you Valley's ownership structure in 2001. It was privatized in, in 1997 and in many trenches until um, uh, Valley's privatization rules took it to this structure. Uh, the National Treasury has a golden share there directly in Valley. 
but that golden share only gives a veto powers to br the Brazilian government uh, regarding Vale's corporate name, which, by the way, changed. Vale was called uh, Companhia uh, Nacional Vale do Rio Doce, and now it's called only Vale. Uh, it prevents Vale from moving its head headquarters to another country, prevents Vale from moving its core purpose from uh, mining, and it prevents Vale from divesting from its uh, core iron ore activities in Brazil. So uh, the Brazilian government didn't seem very powerful through this. Um, and uh, back then, uh, Vale... After privatization, Vale was controlled by a holding corporation called Vale pa Par. And according to the shareholder, shareholders' agreement uh, established by Vale's privatization rules, uh, every shareholder, shareholder controlling Vale, uh, I mean, none of them can pass a, a corporate decision alone. So every, every approval or re rejection of an investment requires 75 approval of voting shares of these uh, shareholders above. So they can't decide anything alone, even though uh, Litel, which is a group of several state pension funds, have over 40% of uh, Vale's control along with uh, the Brazilian private bank Bradesco. Back then, uh, the US Bank of America, uh, uh, BNDES's subsidiary BNDES Par, and uh, Vale's um, pension fund, Invest Vale, which back then was a state pension fund, but isn't anymore now that it is privatized. This group of shareholders elected in 2001 a market guy to become Vale's CEO, which is Roger Agnelli, who was uh, Bradesco's manager for 20 years. And along with it, uh, uh, in the context of Vale's privatization, there was a mineral risk contract between Vale and Benedes to make sure that Vale would have uh, uh, funds into prospect new mineral deposits in Brazil or in, in other countries. Uh, this ownership structure changed a bit, but uh, uh, the US uh, Bank of America uh, left and the Japanese group Mitsui uh, went in, but still none of these shareholders can uh, decide anything alone. And uh, the management of Vale remains unchanged. Uh, considering this and considering the, the case study of Vale, I had studied previously, um, I understand um, 2008 as, as, as an important turning point, but not in regard of Vale's international trajectory of investment, but in regard of Vale's domestic trajectory of investments. Because since Vale was privatized, they divested heavily from any activity non-related to their core business in Brazil. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Vale's new CEO uh, uh, try to take advantage of um, a super cycle in Nine Aurora um, pushed by the Chinese demand. And it started uh, purchasing many, many corporations in the same field uh, abroad. This uh, Valley never received uh, government support to do that. Uh, never received uh, government support to do uh, foreign acquisitions, well, before 2008, neither before, uh, uh, neither after. And it didn't even uh, use um, Benedes's credit, even though it was available to it before 2008. So uh, considering this and all the documents I've reviewed, um, my conclusion about this is that um, in 2008, in the context of the global financial crisis and uh, in the context of massive dismissals in Brazil and abroad, uh, the President Lula started criticizing uh, Vale not because it invested abroad, but because it wasn't investing in Brazil. 
and um, I, I started looking for uh, press sources about this, and through press sources, um, uh, Lula seemed to be pressuring Aguinaldi's administration of Vale uh, really hard. Uh, he wanted Vale to invest more in mining in Brazil. He wanted Vale to invest in logistics. logistics. He wanted Vale to invest in the Northeast. He wanted Vale to uh, invest back in steel in poor regions of Brazil. He wanted Vale to, uh, uh, to uh, make new uh, job uh, opportunities uh, for Brazilians. But even uh, in the war scenario of uh, state uh, of the relationship with Vale uh, between Vale's management and the Brazilian governments, Vale tried to perform an even larger investment than the acquisition of INCO. It, it had acquired INCO for $16 billion in 2006, and in 2009, it tried to acquire Extrata, another competitor, for $100 billion, uh, sponsored by a group of um, foreign banks. Uh, since uh, this relationship wasn't going well, uh, Aguinelli asked uh, Lula's uh, approval to, to do a tender offer. Lula gave an official blessing, and then Vale performed the offer, which was uh, rejected by Extrata General Assembly. So it, it had nothing to do uh, with the government. Uh, so, uh, from 2008 onwards, the, the situation of Valley changed. Uh, uh, I won't focus on this right now, but after uh, suffering uh, much government pressure uh, regarding Valley's business in Brazil, Agnelli resigned. A new CEO became Valley CEO. Uh, uh, but then, uh, not even in that context, uh, Valley decreased uh, its its core business outside Brazil. It just uh, moved forward uh, according to uh, uh, Lula's advice uh, in regard of investing further and diversifying Valley's investments in Brazil. Um, considering the preliminary evidence I have on, on my studies on my study so far, I tend to conclude that um, state power vis-a-vis uh, -vis private power inside Valley uh, is not very relevant. Uh, there was government influence over Valley's domestic investments, but it didn't happen, it didn't really happen through corporate governments, governance. Uh, the government actually used the press to pressure instead of official channels. And um, there are certain questions that I raise to, to guide um, my research from now um, to the future. And I ask, was Valley escaping Brazil? And if it was uh, other large multinational corporations that internationalized back then would be escaping as well? Um, and could Valley explain other cases, uh, other cases of state support in Brazil would be similar, state business relations inside multinational corporations would be similar. And uh, finally, I ask how much comparative value uh, these uh, relations could have um, uh, within the global south, because I tend to think that Brazil uses the same kind of thing that China uses to uh, inside corporations, but that what the Brazilian government achieves or does with it is so different. So aren't other emerging countries, uh, couldn't they be more similar to Brazil than to China? So this is it. Thank you. Okay, let's open the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to ask to Gustavo. Gustavo, very interesting your approach. I want to talk to you about some specific issues after. And I work at, at CADI, uh, another CADI expert or a CAD defense or attorney. I just worked there and I think about the <laughs> the place the place I, I, I work. And 
my concern in your, in your approach, and I want to, to ask you about that, is the, this question. CAD was designed, well, the framework was thinking to, to support a level uh, of political pressure. It's naive to think that there are no political pressure in a governmental uh, body. But now we can see Cadi at the, the center, the middle of the economic and political debate in Brazil. And Cadi now is facing this challenge, this new challenge. Um, the, the body, the functional body you, you studied, you, you, you know, now is have to, to be think in front of, have to challenge this, this, this situation. And I think we can lose some power capacity to, to enforce, and to, to do the enforcement of conducts and the markets. And what do you think about it? It's in, on your concerns, your capital, speak a little about it. Do my question or uh, <laughs> sorry, confused. Uh, I have a question for Sarah. Um, multiple times during your presentation, you specifically mentioned Lula, not exactly Lula government or a government policy. So I'm wondering what's the role of agency there? What's the role of policy? Uh, even though it was used through pressure, not through corporate power or through corporate governance, but through the media, are we talking about part, something that is embedded in a larger policy? Or is it just a personal disaffection with Ali? You know, I, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on that. I have two questions. I'll start with Sarah. So I really appreciate that you're trying to drill down to sort of figure out what like actually happened. Um, and I think one of the, the, the things I'm putting the emphasis on the pressure that's applied in the public, but then Lula gave his blessing to this even larger like foreign acquisition. So this would seem to be a conundrum for the argument that this was genuine sort of like pressure rather than just sort of Lula speaking to the public, right, to try to get this sort of, uh, you know, this, that sort of benefit. But what really was happening is, is almost happening in a way that we can't access as researchers, right? Because the conversations that we're having and where that pressure was really being applied, like we're in these individual conversations, right? And I just wonder like uh, moving forward, like what more, like after you sort of like, what more can we like sort of look at to really understand? Or is there always gonna be some sort of like black box? And because part of the argument is like, once you have these collusive types of relationships, everything does move to these black boxes, right? And that's part of the problematic because you're never really gonna understand what's going on. And that in of itself uh, sort of uh, is, is a problem. When you get to the comparative, right? Comparing between China and Brazil and other places, right? You may be able to get some more insight about the individual, right? Case studies, but that you're not really gonna be able to have like a comparative example because the informal mechanisms are so different. Um, and then for Gustavo, so I wonder then at the beginning, like is, is the question that you had, at, at, is there anything wrong with the question that you had at the beginning? Uh, because so this is the critique of Riles, right? As you spend 10 years studying Japan and in the end you say, we need to humanize regulators, right? And so one of the critiques is like all the performativity takes away like focus on the critical distance, right? And then in a way, so some people say like you, this is essentially like going native, right? You get so embedded in the intrapersonal per per performativity of like the actors that then you don't end up really having to be able to answer the types of questions at the beginning that people still want to ask right um, and so I want to so when people talk about the contribution of like legal and economic anthropology to these types of regulatory questions right it's sort of like we can make the sort of the social theoretical contribution but can we really make like a policy contribution when we focus on things that in a sense become so sort of reflexive to the context they're in and then are we going to have a different answer for the questions at the beginning Hi, um, question for Andre. Um, I love the fact that you actually studied a market. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, have you done comparative studies or are aware of comparative studies of other markets in Brazil or most famously like the, the moving of the hawker markets in Singapore from the street into these complexes and the ways in which that was done and the you know, various impacts that has? 
So that's my a genuine question. And then for Gustavo, your questions that you raise at the end, um, that's exactly what I do from a legal perspective. So we should talk. Okay, <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so just pushing both um, Pedro and Sarah to, to kind of pull out of all your really interesting case stuff that I want to makes me want to read the papers and so on. Okay. Um, Pedro, you, you start out by saying, and of course you were at the disadvantage, you didn't have a PowerPoint, so we were really trying to figure out exactly what you were saying at the same time, but you say you're going to talk about how law is created by economic actors in the process of bank regulation. Okay. And then you gave us lots and lots of examples that I was trying really hard to follow and categorize, but somehow I lost the categorization. So, so my question is, okay, what's the 25 word summary of what you found uh, in answer to that question. And um, for Sarah, um, it wasn't clear to me at the end or even, you know, did the Brazilian state in the 2000s, whether the Lula government or, or, or maybe the development bank or somebody, have a clear strategy on whether they wanted to push uh, foreign companies to internationalize. I mean, I think actually Banias did, um, but it almost sounded from your discussion as though Lula himself or the Lula government wasn't really paying attention until people started to panic about layoffs. And then he said, well, you know, I mean, just like Trump, right? <laughs> Bring the jobs home. <laughs> so I just wanted to push you a little on that. Um, well, I, 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 really, I enjoyed many of the presentation. I'll just focus on the last one about the, the Valley case. I've been doing a bit of looking around the company because it's a, a major company. So, you know, operates in 30 countries, has been doing, you know, has been in the news because the catastrophes, but also in the news because they are doing fantastic technological innovation and investment. So it's a very complex animal to understand. And it doesn't operate only in, I don't know, per se, right? It's been diversifying around a number of areas which are quite strategic for Brazil in many respects, right? Um, both in, the, in terms of you know, supporting, you know, even thinking about chemicals and phosphates and all the stuff that they do for the agricultural sector and other. So what I'm trying to say is that I think you have a, a very complex animal to, to unpack, uh, because if you want to understand what has been the relationship between the state and this company, you really need to understand what are the different things that this company represented over time for this country across a number of sectors and what were the interests that were involved in this negotiation. And I slightly disagree with what uh, was mentioned before. Yes, these are black boxes to a certain extent, in the sense that as soon as you start applying political economy analysis around you know, uh, value concentration, how value has been captured by certain player, how what potential deals, you can start building up hypotheses around uh, how this relationship was developing over time and actually uh, frame your research and your you know investigation almost uh, uh, in terms of validating some of these hypotheses and you know when you work on stuff like corruption and so on this is exactly what you do you will never ask you know you will never have an answer which says yes there was a case of corruption but you will have a quite a clear set of triangulated information which allows to do that and the last point is also this is an industry which uh, is critical also in geopolitical terms. And I'm curious if you have also seen a bit the relationship with China and the relationship with that specific industry. This is the first exporter in the world of iron ore, uh, but of course it's cheaper to import steel from China than actually uh, produce iron ore and produce steel here. So there are lots of problems there, which might actually lead also to, uh, over time, the Lula government protecting an industry in a certain area because it was playing a strategic role, while it was not actually competitive as, as possible, which is not necessarily a negative thing, but it's part of an industrial strategy, which Lula started to develop over several years with the Productive Development Plan, and which never completely you know, unfold as it was planned to. So what I'm saying is to really capture that is a, a fantastic case study, but there are lots of other things that you need to plug in to start actually getting a better sense of what potential is going to be the, the, the final answer, the final interpretation.
Can I, can I start? So, uh, well, trying to answer both questions uh, at the same time, because I think they're very related. Uh, it, what you're asking is, in a way, uh, you're both asking about uh, politics, in a way, and, and how, the, it, how, how can you be answered to that, you know, question that everybody wants to know, if Kaji really works. And, and I think uh, the, 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 I, I also agree with the critiques of Annelise Raz. I think I have several issues with it. But, uh, but the, the thing is that if we can make an ethnography of how Kaji, for example, or any other uh, regulatory board actually works, we are able to understand uh, what are the reasons that, or different reasons for why it, wor it works or it doesn't work. For example, just to give an example, uh, I'm fo I, was, I focused on, I did an ethnography of documents, for example, and the very particular ways that some, uh, some administrative proceedings, for example, of M&As are, are left in the, in the, in the, in the, in a, in a, in a, in a well, they're somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the room, and they're not there, uh, and the temporality of, of different documents. So, the, the particular micro politics of how certain uh, proceedings are, are, are left behind, this explains a lot of what, what's going on inside and why, for example, some. Uh, why Kaji, for example, in the last uh, uh, few years, for, uh, decided to 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 leave MNAs uh, to the side and just to focus on on cartels. So they're, they're actually leading to a new configuration in the in Brazilian markets, so the configuration of, of larger firms, and then leading with the result of these larger firms. So I think that we, if, if we can understand what goes on inside, we might be able to 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 understand why it works in a. But but from a different, completely different point of view. Not if it works. Uh, so this is why. What so so paying attention to things like temporality, documents, materiality. Th these things they, they they matter because you know in micro politics inside the antitrust, this is what goes on. So the the the, the disputes between different experts, uh, different but different uh, areas of of research or or expertise. So this is what uh, well trying to. We can we can talk later. This is it. Uh, okay. Um, comparative studies. Yes. Um, uh, there have been uh, a whole. Uh, uh, some some people think that what is going on with all these uh, urban uh, street markets is a process that started in China actually with these uh, shopping complexes, right? So. Uh, there is a comparative dimension to it. Of course, uh, we have to, uh, to bear in mind that uh, this was an informal market that has been through uh, several waves of formalization. And informality means very different things in different settings, not, not just legally, uh, but uh, Brazil has uh, its own long uh, term history with, with uh, informal labor markets and informal uh, economic activities. That's very different, for example, from places like Argentina that also has a large, like Buenos Aires has a large uh, uh, street uh, urban market that uh, is similar to the line market, La Salada, and uh, other markets that uh, can be found in Moscow or, or, or even in Mexico City. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, um, you find that sort of phenomenon in other places, but they're linked to different uh, uh, historical contexts and political contexts and economic contexts, uh, which I think that uh, uh, are very important to understand the development of this, the, these things. The second uh, point that is interesting is that uh, when I conducted that study, I was uh, more interested in uh, tracing the international connections of these markets, because uh, most of the goods that are being uh, uh, sold in, in Sao Paulo are uh, bought in Iwu, uh, which has a lo the largest uh, market of that sort in the entire world, uh, and, and Guangzhou and other cities, and even Hong Kong, actually. So um, uh, many of the traders are, are uh, uh, Chinese uh, with direct connections uh, with producers or uh, these markets in China. And, and, and I was uh, more interested in uh, the ways uh, these goods uh, uh, came from China to Brazil and from Brazil uh, to the entire continent, actually, and even to Africa. Some, some people from, from Africa came uh, to Sao Paulo uh, to buy these goods. Uh, yeah, thank you. First, so uh, I will try to be brief at this time. And I, what I'm trying to do here is to 
pave uh, a, a path of dialogue between uh, economic sociology scholarship with social legal studies on the economic field. I believe that uh, it is already clear that uh, uh, for economic sociology that uh, banking markets are institutionally built and uh, uh, pervaded by politics. Uh, what is less clear and less obvious, um, I think, is that uh, how uh, how to explore the details of this institutional uh, institutional construction, and how the politics of Marx is uh, an ongoing process. And uh, at this this point, I, I think a social legal analysis can be enlightening. And I try in this in, in this uh, paper to explore the two process um, by which law construct marks and explore these two uh, dim dimensions and which are first the naturalization process uh, the th law has the uh, law naturalize certain concepts uh, schemes ru uh, rules interpretations and, and by this process uh, become uh, uh, incorporated into the assumptions of the economic activity so what a, a bank is and how it differs in terms of rights and obligations from other companies, etc., is also uh, built within law. And a second process is that uh, the politics is, is, is played within the law. And so uh, law uh, uh, entails uh, conflicts uh, uh, between normative meanings that can be drawn from its interpretation. And so uh, I think these both uh, processes uh, are uh, can uh, turn clear how markets are built and institutionally and politically built. And I try to go further and explain that law is is product in in multiple arenas. So this is a, a kind of approach I'm trying to do, and I believe that this kind of approach can create an alternative description of the, the the case I'm studying, that is the Brazilian case. That's it. Okay, thank you all for the questions. I'm going to answer first Raquel's and Leslie. Um, so, I think in, in different ways you both asked me if there was a policy behind it. Uh, so I, you have to establish strategies to do this kind of presentation. There, there are many, uh, many um, levels of analysis going on here. Uh, but I think that uh, the problem that Valley's management uh, had with Lula had to do with uh, elections. Uh, electoral pressures. And, and I think that may explain why Lula in person used, uh, that's why I say him, because sometimes I'm talking about his administration, but sometimes I'm really talking about him. He, he went there in person to criticize Aguinaldi in person and Vali uh, as a single corporation. And uh, Brazil was doing really well. It did well after the crisis, and it wasn't the time to fire people. It was it was relevant to have full employment, uh, uh, so Lula could uh, elect uh, his successor. And um, I, I also think that Vali, if we think of Vali in the 90s, uh, it was also, I, I don't know why Brazilians look at it uh, as a sort of national heritage or something, because it's like in mining. But uh, Vali was always a profitable uh, state owned mining corporations compared to other uh, mining corporations and compared to state owned corporations. So I tend to think that it was always a source of employment to Brazilians, and that maybe that's why Fernando Henrique Cardoso chose to push for its privatization in his second term after all other mining and steel corporations were already privatized. And maybe that's why Lula didn't want it firing people and didn't want it uh, escaping Brazil uh, in a context of elections. Um, but about, uh, uh, there is, is there a policy behind what I said here? I think that in, 
in Lula's administration, in the level of the federal government, there wasn't a policy for FDI. Uh, the Brazilian Development Bank wanted to launch a credit line since 1995. They had been, their reports are, are, are very rich uh, uh, source of research because they had been um, uh, investigating the, the ability of Brazilian corporations to go overseas since 1994, uh, when they were very independent from the federal government. So, yes, the Brazilian Development Bank wanted to do more, but it never received attention from the federal government. And different administrations inside the bank wanted to do more. And uh, the Brazilian Development Bank wanted to be one of the uh, providers of credits in many of Vale's large uh, cross-border deals, and Vale never wanted to use it, uh, its credits. It always preferred to use net, net cash flows or foreign debt. Um, and uh, this takes me to Antonio's question. Thank you very much uh, for that, because there certainly are other uh, other other levels of analysis to understand uh, the relationship of Valley with the government regarding other subjects other than elections. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, how to find the problem. That's why I'm, I'm trying to understand if there was some kind of escapism. escapism. Because uh, mining is very regulated, but Valley wasn't suffering uh, great government pressure before Lula. Um, but at the same time, uh, investing heavily abroad could uh, isolate government pressures that could come after. So yeah, your, this is to say your question is very relevant and I need to address that and I hope I find something. And about your uh, black box question, I also agree with it. But what I think, what I, tr I do uh, different from uh, other people that try to, to uh, other people that had perform, have performed case studies like this, they, they're not usually in law, they're usually in economics. Uh, uh, they tend to interpret uh, the holding of equity or lending at, um, according to some assumed, um, th they give assumed interpretations to this. So they don't look to the shareholders agreement to see who has power and who hasn't. And they rarely use press sources to research anything. So I think that by looking uh, to press materials and, and uh, comparing them to official sources from corporations and from the government, I may shed more light to this black box, which will be dark uh, anyway. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the end of uh, this is the end of the fifth panel. We have a break now, and then we go for the final one. Okay, so thank you so much.